and sex. Those are my two passions. It's only natural to combine them. Do you like cake? Yes. Do you like my ass? Yes. Do you want to eat cake off my ass? What kind of cake? Let me get one of them titties to go, <laughs> a side of ass, and a cup of them lips. Well, I'm sorry, sir, because they don't have none of that on the menu. Is your muffin buttered? Yes! Yes! Oh! Yes! I'll have what she's having. Oh my god. I guess we could use some food in our lovemaking. <laughs> Got your strawberries, your chocolate sauce, your pastrami on rye with mustard. I love food and I love sex. So guess what we're gonna talk about? What does food say about gender, class, and superstition? And why are people so titillated by food porn and cringe videos of people basically fucking their food as they cook it? Let's talk about it all in a short history of sex and food by looking at myth, art, culture, and real events. This delicious video is going to make you hungry, so be warned. It's wild that vanilla is the term used for no frills, boring sex, when vanilla was once a highly coveted, expensive, and hard to procure spice, believed to have aphrodisiac properties. While native to Mexico, vanilla got its name from Spanish colonizers in the 16th century who thought the plant looked like vulvas. So they christened them vanilla, a derivative of vagina or sheath. But as we all know, words change. And today, vanilla has a colloquial meaning of plain sex. Whether you enjoy vanilla sex or something more exotic, Beducated wants to help you improve your love life, especially if you have a vulva. If you want to build on your basic knowledge, Beducated has courses on everything from penetration to female orgasm to oral sex. If you want to step outside the box and add some cherries, sprinkles, sauces, or nuts to your vanilla scoop, Beducated has lessons on bondage, shibari, BDSM, and more. There are over a hundred courses featuring detailed instructions and videos from certified experts. And Beducated has a delicious and rare offer right now. When you use my code ELEXIS33, you get 33% off the lifetime pass for the cost of an annual subscription. And there's a 14-day money-back guarantee. And if you're feeling a little hesitant, you can test out Beducated for free for 24 hours. Click the link in my description box to get started. Now, let's bite into this history. celebrated Greek deities, Dionysus, was believed to be the god of wine, fruit, vegetation, ecstasy, madness, and theater. Wine, with its power to make you drunk in an era where you had an extremely limited understanding of the world around you, was often believed to be a religious experience. As an outsider god believed to arrive in communities, Dionysus was known as the god who comes, an amazing double entendre. Early celebrations involved parades of people carrying phallic-shaped objects and loaves of bread. By the time of the Romans, Maenads, the female worshippers, drank, ate, danced, and chanted themselves into a frenzy, hoping to be possessed by Bacchus, aka Dionysus, and experience a glimpse of true madness and abandon. They were depicted in art as being willing to kill those who denied the sanctity of their god. According to Livy, Bacchus was initially celebrated around 200 BC by women three times a year in the daytime before turning into an all-out orgy type event where food and drink was enjoyed without limits. Livy claimed that during these celebrations there were sacrificial murders and homosexuality featuring high-status individuals like Nero and Caligula and 7,000 initiated cultists. So he was conservative and considered the alleged orgy feast celebrations to be a sign of Rome's increased moral decay. The nighttime celebrations were eventually outlawed and driven underground. The legend of the torrid feasts for Bacchus were a popular art subject during the Renaissance, with the Bacchanalia by Peter Paul Rubens in 1615 featuring nudity, sex, and fruit. Even in the 19th century, William Eddy found inspiration with a Bacchanalian revel. My favorite depiction of Maenads in worship of Dionysus is in season two of HBO's True Blood. The Maenad character, Marianne, hosts orgies, gets people drunk, and eats to excess. Stuffed snapper with a crawfish topping. 
the blackened ribeye, the red beans and rice, the, ooh, the fried catfish, and, um, oh dear. Now, would it be possible to get the smothered pork chops for lunch, even though it's listed here in the dinner entrees? Hmm? Sexual feasts were also found in East Asia with the fringe and esoteric Gana Chakra of Hindu Tantra and Tantric Buddhism. Depending on the worshippers, traditions featured alcohol, meat, fish, grain, and sex. This is especially interesting because meat, fish, and wine were considered taboo in medieval India when these rituals came to be. According to Miranda Shaw, practitioners sit in a circle and partake of sacramental dry meat and wine, often liquor, served in skull cups. The feasts also provide an occasion for the exchange of ritual lore, the ritual worship of women, and the performance of sexual yogas. Let's move to 10th century Germany, where the Bishop Bruchard of Worms wrote in his penance guide, have you done what some women are wont to do? They take a live fish and put it in their vagina, keeping it there for a while until it is dead. Then they cook or roast it and give it to their husbands to eat, doing this in order to make men be more ardent in their love for them. If you have, you should do two years of penance on the appointed fast days. According to Dr. Kate Lister, there were other sordid recipes that warranted penance. Ask Bishop B, have you done what some women are accustomed to do? They lie face down on the ground, uncover their buttocks, and tell someone to make bread on their naked buttocks. When they have cooked it, they give it to their husbands to eat. They do this to make them more ardent in their love for them. Dr. Lister found anecdotes from women who made quote unquote cockle bread, including a 17th century observer who detailed how young wenches would get upon a table board and as they gather up their knees and their coats with their hands as high as they can, and then they wobble to and fro with their buttocks as if they were kneading the dough with their arses. Whilst doing their wobbling, the women would sing a chant that later became outfitted as a children's nursery rhyme. Then they'd present the bread, sometimes said to be molded into the vulva, to the man they wanted to marry. Delicious! For centuries, the whispers of a ritual involving menstrual blood and pasta sauce to make a man fall in love with you is a superstitious demonstration of the old adage, the way to a person's heart is through their stomach. As detailed by John Variano, the decrescendo of the Renaissance into the Reformation period saw more artists incorporating phallic and or vulgar symbols into their paintings. A new theme was Bacchus and Ceres, the goddess of crops taking care of Venus, like without Ceres and Bacchus, Venus freezes, meaning without food and wine, love dies. Food was also used as a metaphor in poems and naughty limericks, with one 16th century writer using peaches to describe as thusly. Oh fruit, blessed above all others, good before, in the middle, and after the meal but perfect behind. Onions and radishes were also used as terms for ass. The nipples and breasts of women, as we discuss in A Short History of Boobs, were compared to cherries and apples. And speaking of cherries, wrote etymologist Jonathan Green, the image of the cherry is based on an idea of ripeness, and thus the virginity tends to be seen as something that sooner or later is due to be lost. He found that using the terms popping or busting cherries began in the 1900s, when cherries were a regular artistic motif for virginity and purity. While no food has been scientifically proven to be a aphrodisiac, throughout history, numerous foods from oysters to beans have been thought to cause lustiness. The Kama Sutra listed out a bunch of things from milk to asparagus to nutmeg. In the 18th through 20th centuries, there were a bunch of moral panics over alleged aphrodisiacs, which was a reflection of globalization, ethnic mixing, and the threat of feminism to gendered spheres. Chocolate, long believed in various cultures to get the juices flowing, was said by historian Carol Groneman to be a key thing thought to cause nymphomania in 18th century France. Historical rumor persists that during the time of the Aztecs, the Emperor Montezuma II drank dozens of cups of hot cocoa a day to remain vigorous, strong, and able to please his many wives. While this early cocoa was nothing like the chocolate of today, it had came to prominence after the expansion of colonial sugar plantations in the 17th century, and monks and nuns were forbidden to consume it in case it drove them to do something naughty. Not that most people could afford it, 
wrote Charles Perry. When the first chocolate shop in London opened in 1657, it sold ready-to-brew chocolate with sugar, nuts, and spices already blended in for 10 to 15 shillings a pound, far beyond most people's budget. So chocolate was for rich people perusing small shops and chocolate houses, something to fantasize about and covet. It wouldn't become a hot commodity for regular people until the 19th century. And the stories of its powers as an aphrodisiac caused some people to rebuke it. It was one of the many foods Sylvester Graham advised people not to eat because it might make you want to touch yourself, allegedly. You can learn more about him and the development of the graham cracker and other sexless foods in A Short History of Masturbation. Tea was also the target of moral panics during the colonial era, with one observer alleging in 1745 that tea would prevent that quiet harmony which ought to subsist betwixt man and wife, causeth disobedience and domestic strife, and at last the artful hussies lay all the blame on their husbands. And then there was ice cream. Ice cream, a time-consuming endeavor, required cream, eggs, and crushed ice, so it was mostly for the upper class prior to 1900. But entrepreneurs in urban centers in the late 1890s, many of them Italian and using gelato recipes from the old country, hawked the dessert on the street. By the early 1900s, they and Middle Eastern ice cream hawkers were opening up ice cream shops, and these became a new arena of courtship, where unmarried women could safely meet men. But because these shops were owned by recent immigrants, there was a backlash. Ice cream parlors are the places where scores of girls have taken their first step downward, complained the writer of fighting the war on the white slave trade in 1910. White slavery conspiracy theories had links in anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and racism. Depending on who you asked, Jews, Middle Easterners, Italians, Asians, or black people were kidnapping good Christian white women into sex trafficking. And Italians, as we'll learn in future content about American food history, created a network of food production that made their fruit saloons or grocery grocery stores robust with exotic eats like the banana. And these places, along with ice cream shops, were fused in the public mind with gang wars, brothels, and mafia stories. Claimed the district attorney in Chicago, not all the ice cream and fruit saloons have foreign-born proprietors and are connected with the white slave traffic, but some of them are. And this fact is sufficient to cause all careful and thoughtful parents of young girls to see that they do not frequent these places. Summed up Bill Ellis, like other urban inner zones such as movie theaters, buses and trains, and amusement parks, ice cream parlors were culturally dangerous places, precisely because they were sites in which ethnic groups met mingled and held social intercourse. This didn't stay the case for long as ice cream became Americanized and more widely available. So recall how the ancient worshippers of Dionysus slash Bacchus enjoyed food and frivolity? The presence of food during sexual activities and erotic performances continued for the remainder of time. In the red light districts of Edo period Japan, there was Neo Taimori, or the practice of serving sushi on a woman's naked body, a practice that became more prominent in the 20th century. It's an eccentric and upscale party fad in the present day, seen on reality shows, criticized as objectifying, and utilized by Samantha Jones in the Sex and the City movie. Another modern example of food and sexualized spaces are gentlemen's clubs and strip clubs, which are renowned for breakfast buffets and wings. Brothels and cat houses also appeal to their clientele and take more of their money by offering food. Tiramisu, the Italian dessert composed of ladyfinger cookies soaked in espresso, egg, sugar, and mascarpone is at the center of a popular legend that says the treat was served to 19th century brothel patrons in Treviso, Italy, to keep them awake and ready to spend more money on girls. Another Italian dish wrapped up in sex worker urban legend is spaghetti alla puttanesca, which means spaghetti in the style of a whore. It's made with anchovies, capers, olives, tomatoes, and spices such as chili pepper, red pepper flakes, and garlic. Some say it was a dish made by sex workers between clients. Others claim the aphrodisiac ingredient ingredients lured clients to the workers' doors, and food historian Jeremy Parzin theorized, Italians use puttana and related words almost the way we use shit, as an all-purpose profanity. So pasta a la puttanesca might have originated with someone saying, essentially, I just threw a bunch of shit from the cupboard into a pan. 
1972, Dowd Alani and Jack S. Margolis published Cooking for Orgies and Other Large Parties, which combined frugal and creative recipes for large crowds, like baked potatoes with elixir of crab, coffee zucchini, and lovely chicken legs with erotic illustrations. The book was in part dedicated to Julia Child, who was invited to come to our house next week, sit around naked, and have some really good food for a change. They wrote, the host of an orgy will not want to spend much time in preparing or serving the food during the evening because he will want to conserve his strength in order to participate in other activities. Also that year, the 1972 illustrated classic, The Joy of Sex, A Gourmet Guide to Lovemaking debuted, and it was based on the 1931 best-selling cookbook, The Joy of Cooking. It was organized into starters, main courses, and sauces and pickles. The writer, Dr. Alex Comfort, was intentionally linking sex to food, writing, a cookery book is an unanxious account of available dishes, culinary fantasies, as well as staple dishes. And I wanted to write an unanxious account of the full repertoire of human heterosexuality. For most of the 20th century, cookbooks for young wives have been accompanied with marital and or sex advice. The fusion of sex and cooking instruction continued with 1965's The Gay Cookbook, 1970's Fanny Hill's Cookbook, featuring recipes by a fictionalized version of the popular 18th century sex worker character. Conservative marriage guru Maribel Morgan, who we discussed at length in Lectual Does the 70s, episode 5, encouraged her readers to entice their husbands after work with heavy, delicious dinners and sex, showcasing an important component of the ideal evangelical woman, feeding and fucking your man. She applauded a housewife who welcomed her husband home in black mesh stockings, high heels, and an apron, and encouraged her readers to get nasty everywhere in the house, including under the dining room table. For these conservative women, who so often were portrayed as being sexless, Morgan's massive success hinged on sexing up regular housewife duties, particularly for housewives afraid that they lose their husbands to the influx of single women in the workplace in the 70s. Speaking of housewives, a popular recipe making its way around PTA meetings and finding its way into women's community recipe books, newspaper columns, and magazines was the so-called better than sex cake. According to Ashley D. Stevens, there were four distinct versions in circulation. The first is a vanilla cake topped with sweet crushed pineapple that's been stewed with sugar, followed by a thick layer of vanilla pudding that's then topped with whipped cream and coconut flakes. The next variation also starts with vanilla cake batter, this time blended with chocolate chunks, sour cream, and nuts. The third included chocolate sheet cake, condensed milk, cool whip, crushed candy, and chocolate sauce. That one sounds like it's for me. Wrote Bonnie McDowell, the fourth was made thusly. First flour, butter, and chopped pecans are mixed together and pressed in a pan and baked. A layer of cream cheese, confectioner's sugar, and whipped topping are spread on top of that. Then vanilla pudding and chocolate pudding are mixed together and spread over that. It's then topped with whipped topping and garnished with shaved chocolate. These decadent housewife swapped recipes, along with the name, are usually described as sinful once in a while treats and demonstrates the way sex and dessert have been considered naughty and indulgent. Speaking of indulgent, when's the last time you tried something new in bed, baby. If you're thinking I've already tried everything, that means you haven't been on Beducated yet. With over a hundred courses, there's definitely something new to try. Whether you want to work on your intimacy skills or squirting, please your vulva and don't forget to click the link in my bio and use my code ELEXIS33 to get 33% off a lifetime pass or a 24 hour free trial. In 1979, Michael Jacobson coined the term food porn to connote a food that was so sensationally out of bounds of what a food should be that it deserved to be considered pornographic. During this same period in the decade after, the average porn consumer who tiptoed the aisles of dirty magazine and video stores might see sploshing, the fetish involving messy foodstuffs, like somebody smashing a cake with a body part. Solo and non-solo porn incorporated phallic food Foods, reflecting some women's first sex toy experiences before the widespread availability of silicone. But even the average woman could come across the combination of food and sex. During a time with an increasing availability of food for pleasure and consumption, compared to the routine food scarcity of past generations, thanks to well-stocked groceries and disposable income, more magazines and sex guides were recommending incorporating foods like honey, whipped cream, syrup, and even peanut butter into sexual repertoires. 
In particular, I'm thinking of the tips offered in 1980s and beyond Cosmopolitan magazines. Erotic bakeries also started popping up during the 80s. And the 90s yielded sex ed courses with bananas sheathed in condoms for instructional purposes. The American Pie scene and the infamous Varsity Blue scene in which Allie Larder's character greets her target in a whipped cream bikini. The obvious instructions being to remove the cream with one's mouth. Decades later, the incorporation of food into sex is still regularly depicted in media and offered as advice, while at the same time, food porn has grown in proliferation. Food featuring gushy, oozing, creamy, and other tantalizing components is popular. Wrote a columnist in 1990 during the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic. This is not an X-rated column, but in the interest of good reporting, I must point out that a lot of people these days are carrying the safe sex campaign one step further. For Christmas, I received a cookbook that offers four recipes for better than sex cake. A few weeks later, I was at a restaurant in New Orleans that featured better than sex icebox chocolate pie. Another columnist wrote a satirical essay wondering if she could get her adult children to abstain from sex with the cake. She was joking, but recent data shows that for some people, food is better than sex. As recently as 2021, researchers calculated that approximately 62,000 posts with the hashtag food porn are shared each day. And a study of 49 people found that some people were more sexually aroused by food porn images than actual erotic images, suggesting that some people may be sexually attracted to food. Don't judge me, food. food. And trigger them to eat more than those who aren't. Maybe one day research will give us more on cytophilia or sexual arousal involving food. Think of every person you've ever seen joke about a raw chicken breast or slutty looking fruit half looking delicious. So the fusing of sex and food on social media is par for the course. We are a culture that loves this fusion and also loves being repulsed by it. Popular food porn memes and media fusing food and sex include everything from Salt Bay to cringe videos of people basically fucking food as they cook it. Every few months, a business with coochie or penis donuts or waiters shoving phallic food stuffs into your mouth goes viral. Eateries like Egg Slut, Slutty Vegan, and Sexy Fish promise glamorous and gourmet priced indulgent meals that may make you think of sex based off of the names alone. While Carl's Jr. began as an innocent hot dog cart in 1941 by Christians Carl and Margaret Karcher in Los Angeles, it was a global chain by the early 2000s with marketing campaigns targeting the young and horny. Said CEO Andrew Puzder when the company was criticized, I like our ads. I like beautiful women eating burgers and bikinis. I think it's very American. In 2011, after more backlash, the company issued a statement saying, we believe in putting hot models in our commercials because ugly ones don't sell burgers. Carl Karcher, who spent a million dollars in the 70s to unsuccessfully keep LGBT people out of California public schools, was reported as saying that he was heartbroken that a company he founded on Christian principles had taken such an immoral act. In addition to sexualized ads, restaurants like Hooters have become successful because servers are scantily clad and flirty, showcasing their off-limits body parts while doling out plates of wings and mozzarella sticks. There's also often a sexual component to mukbang videos, in which people sit and consume food for an audience. For some people, it's about absolving loneliness and other non-sexual reasons. I know, some people watch it just because, you know, they like to be social and shit, but a whole bunch of people are watching that shit because they are horny. Okay? Look, look at me. I'm gonna say it again. A lot of people are watching those videos because they are Horny. The dipping, the slurping, chewing, licking, cracking, and sucking is an arousing ASMR experience for some people. Lots of people have made big money by eating food in a sexualized manner, especially conventionally attractive and or skinny women who are able to eat large quantities. The mukbang genre came to prominence worldwide in 2010 after South Korean people began posting videos and it was a reflection of South Korean food culture in which people typically don't eat alone. But people with feederism fetishes enjoy mukbang for different reasons. According to a 2023 study, research has shown that overweight male viewers of mukbang were motivated to do so by a desire to fantasize about thin, attractive female mukbangers gorging themselves on large quantities of food and that skinny women's audiences were primarily overweight men. 
Troublingly, but not surprisingly, the appearance of the mukbanger influences how the mukbanger is perceived and whether or not the viewer feels yearning, disgust, pleasure, shame, envy, or desire. So the reactions to mukbangs are often wrapped up in fat phobia and classism. Never eat a plate that looks like this. You couldn't even pay me a million dollars to do that to myself. Mm. Oh my God. Is it I deserve better than that. That's mm. low vibration. And you took it. I would've been like, I'm playing like that. This harkens back to two 1995 studies by Arizona State University researchers on diet and morality, which found that women who had unhealthier diets and ate more were perceived to be of looser morals and lazier. A study of over 900,000 online reviews of 6,500 American restaurants found that the more expensive the restaurant, the more likely you are to describe the food in terms of sex. Cheap food, meanwhile, was compared to drugs. Food also continues to hold gendered connotations, wrote Bruce Fierstein in the 1982 bestseller Real Men Don't Eat Quiche. Could John Wayne ever have taken Normandy, Iwo Jima, Korea, the Gulf of Tonkin, and the entire Wild West on a diet of quiche and salad? The 18th century men who feared the effeminization of tea mirrored the 1990s men who feared Zima. And this is perpetuated by some women too, as I've seen tweets calling men gay for liking smoothies, liking hot dogs, aka glizzies, or sucking lollipops. There's an entire discipline and set of guidelines for companies seeking to advertise diet meals and food products to men. Because food is often wrapped up in expectations of gender. Wrote the man who advised food marketers to gender food using Sigmund Freud as a guide, perhaps the most typically feminine food is cake. The wedding cake is the symbol of the feminine organ. The act of cutting the first slice by the bride and bridegroom together clearly stands as a symbol of defloration. In modern music, food is still a potent metaphor for sex and love in every genre. From 112's Peaches and Cream, to Khaleesi's Milkshake, to Meg the Stallion and Dua Lipa's Sweetest Pie, to 21 Savage asking if a woman's thick thighs come with rice, to Doja Cat's never-ending lyrics about food and sex, there are a ton of food lyrics. Tell me your favorite in the comments. My favorite bit of food slash sex poetry goes to Jill Scott, who sang in 2000's It's Love. Do you want it on your rice and gravy? Do you want it on your biscuits, baby? Do you want it on your black eyed peas? Feed it to me, feed it to me, feed it. She sings it better than I just said it. There are a bunch of other ways we can see the clear connection between sex and food. Dinner is a common first date and pre-setting for commercial sex. The similarities of food service workers and sex workers has been explored in media like The Menu. There's, there's Eve being tempted by pomegranate slash apples in the Garden of Eden. Once a symbol of purity, cherries are now a symbol of sexuality and regularly used by sex workers, notably in the early days of Black Twitter's Ho Twitter subculture by Taylor Nicole Milfi Crenshaw. In 2012, a clip video of sex expert Denise Walker, aka Auntie Angel, utilizing a grapefruit on a dildo went viral and encouraged several men to ask their partners, you like grapefruit? It was later referenced in the 2017 film Girls Trip. Auntie Angel came up with the idea in 1997 because she had never given head before and wanted to make it more appealing. Another viral fruit food stunt involved the infamous cucumber parties held in Atlanta in 2019 featuring Use your imaginations, cause I can't show no pictures, okay? You gonna have to pretend that you see something right here, okay? Otherwise YouTube gonna get me the fuck up out of here. In 2015, artist Stephanie Sarley began posting popular videos of her caressing and touching fruit, saying it's basically about personifying and empowering vaginas through humor and absurdity. The account was suspended at least three times for being sexually suggestive, according to Instagram. And now I'm worried that when I include these videos in this video, like when I show this fruit getting fingered, YouTube is gonna demonetize me, I'm scared. But y'all gotta see this for yourself. In this video, I didn't really step into the fetishy sides of eating, featuring body excrements, a la two girls, one cup shock video, or feederism in which people eroticize weight gain and or force feeding, and vor in which people have an erotic desire to be consumed or to consume another person, though not automatically in a cannibalistic fashion. There are erotic dinner parties where servers are full or nearly nude or people enjoy meals with 
a sex show on the side. On the supernatural side, vampires, whose penetration of flesh for sustenance has routinely been linked to sex, and it also deserves a mention. But the last observation that I wanna make is that food is inextricably linked to sex because humans need food to survive. Humans also need sex to continue the species. But at the base level, there is no survival of an individual without food. Because food has generally been a commodity and too many times a scarcity, whether by natural or unnatural means, food, like the other human necessity, shelter, has been a means of sexual exploitation. A July 2022 study from Columbia University looked at food insecurity in Sub-Saharan Africa and found that severe food insecurity approximately doubles the risk of contracting HIV among women in six countries in the region because it often leads them to engage in transactional sex. They also concluded that giving women in Sub-Saharan Africa direct food support resulted in a significant 64% decrease in risk of contracting HIV. While researching this video, it was really interesting to me to see the ways food has been lingering in the background of our explorations of sex history. From masturbation to oral sex to boobs to metaphors and explicit lyrics, Food has always been there, beneath the surface. I hope this was a fun video for you. I hope you learned something new and I hope it also gave you something to think about. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you like, comment, and subscribe.